hello, everybody. It's Undermine Season 4, Episode 13 of Baker's Dozen. Speaking of, someone should sometime do a podcast about that, don't you think, RJ? Anyway, here we are, and we have made it to the mid-90s, arriving in 1995. We have several more amazing fish shows to cover, 12 actually, to be exact, before we arrive at the mind-blowing tour that we all love, Fall 1997. And my co-host today is Osiris CEO, RJB. Hey, RJ, how's my favorite co-host? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Thomas. Um, so we've we've finally arrived at this tour that um, we've talked about this so much over the years on HF Pod and, and elsewhere. It's, it's such a, a fascinating, beautiful at times, frustrating at times tour to summer 95. I think you're like, you're either on one side or the other of summer 95 and time. I know you were listening back to the show today and you were, you were confused and frustrated and, and like, it's just a, it's a, such a wild tour, but we had to, we had to go and look at 622.95 from Finger Lakes. And luckily we have a, a guest who is very close to the stage for that. And um, this show is known for a word, one word that doesn't even exist. It's not even a real word, but we'll talk about that later. Um, we're going to talk with our guests about this. By the summer of 95, fish had exploded in popularity. And I think the conventional wisdom was that Jerry died in August of 95, and then like a bunch of dead fans flooded the scene. And I was looking back, and in, in June 95, they played a bunch of huge venues for the first time. So while the dead were still touring, Riverport, Lakewood, Nissan, Deer Creek, Blossom, um, those were all 20,000 or more you know, capacity venues and a bunch of large venues that they were visiting for the second or third time. So this, um, you know, they were, they were well on their way and whether the dead ending fed into it, I'm sure it did, but they were already getting there on their own, but we're going to talk about the second longest tweezer of all time. And it's going to take us uh, hopefully not as long as the tweezer is to deconstruct it, but we, so we better get our guest on here, but if you're enjoying, please review and uh, give us give us five stars wherever you uh, wherever you get your podcast, and consider subscribing to Osiris Premium on Apple, where you get ad free podcasts, bonus episodes, and more. All right, Tom, who do we have joining us today? Today we have Lenny Stubby, a longtime taper, a fish fan, and friend of the pods. Uh, some of you might remember him from Under the Scales, and certainly also from HF Pod. And I'm going to let him in from the waiting room right now. And uh, welcome, Lenny Stubby, to Undermine. There he is. Hey, Lenny. Hey, guys. How are you? Thanks for joining us today. Lenny, uh, could you, let's just jump right in. Can you tell us about your background as a dead taper and then as one of the original fish tapers leading up to this show in June 1995? Yeah, absolutely. So I really uh, didn't get into taping until probably that summer, to be honest. And oh. we... Yeah. And then really just at that point was deeply immersed in rec music fish from spring on when I discovered the internet in the spring of 95 and, you know, really just, you know, with the likes of Charlie Dirksen and others on rec music fish, just getting tapes out there for people. So initially I was really the tape pusher, the tape trader and the tape tree plant tree seed planter. Right. And then bringing decks to shows after Jerry died, uh, was really uh, when I started getting very involved in the taper section and and then getting mics and so on. So, did you um, did you notice? Uh, and this, I guess, uh, this is June, so Jerry's still alive during the show. But yeah. had you noticed an influx of people on Fish Tour from Dead Tour, or did that kind of not happen yet? Yeah, I don't think it it it, uh, it really happened uh, yet. I think we definitely, of course, we saw it in the fall. Uh, I'll never forget Knickerbocker Arena in December. You know, where there's probably sixty tapers. Uh, you know, it was unbelievable. And uh, but no, I mean, and I was, you know, this summer I'd only seen two shows because, you know, the bands were were in the, in the same area, right? They were literally on I ninety at this time together. You know, the dead were in Albany, fish were in Canandaigua. And I had seen Blossom went over to Albany to catch the summer solstice show and the Knickerbocker Arena and then took Canandaigua because I didn't have a ticket for the second night of the dead. And I had second row, thanks to Shelly, uh, in Canandaigua. So and fourth row in front of Mike for Blossom. So wow. there was I, people, I think there were a lot of people certainly jumping back and forth. 
Um, and I was one to wear fish. I, I, I've circulated pictures of me wearing fish t-shirts in summer 95 at Grateful Dead shows. Uh, so it was, it was fun. It was playful and it, it was just a great time. I get a lot of energy out of talking about this this time. That's really cool. Then I, when you made that point about the, the, the dead and fishing, I think you, in your notes to me, you said something about, you know, they were, they were being brave, um, playing just down the, down I-90 from, yeah, I mean, you I mean, know, it's, it's I, kind of amazing. I get a little like choked up, almost a little emotional talking about this era because you know it was a special time for me, very personally. But just thinking back on it now, and and fish, the legacy of fish, as we all know, is evolution, right? There's never been. I don't think there's a band that's evolved as consistently as as fish, right? Uh, just constantly re-identifying, repaving new roads. And I almost looked like you know thinking about the Fleezer and, and that show and having been second row and right in front of Trey Row BB. And uh, for that whole show, uh, I don't know, it was kind of like, a, it was kind of like, hey, we're fish, we're on the 92 and we're doing our thing, right? It wasn't a conventional show. In a summer tour that I felt like the first sets were super, uh, reasonably mellow. A lot of the magic happened traditionally. They, they, they took it, I think, in a tr- traditional approach, right? You know, the, the Mud Island tweezer, the, the, the Raleigh runaway gym, all second sets, the Fleezer, um, you know, and it was kind of like there was no spring tour. Um, the dead and, and fish were colliding in the Northeast, which was wild because fish was, they had made a name for themselves. So it, it was just an amazing time. And uh, I just, uh, I really love talking about it. So. So we got, um, we, we had to choose these 25 shows that lead up to fall 97. And sure. thankfully we haven't actually gotten a lot of shit from listeners about the shows we didn't choose, but Summer 95 might be the first where we hear hear a little bit because there's a lot of great shows, there's a lot of like really out there jams, you know, Mud Island, Jones Beach. I mean, there's so many. Um, but this this show really is just about one jam, um, or at least just that one set. Uh, how do you feel before we get into the details? How do you feel about this being our one stop on the Summer 95 tour? I, th- I you know, a lot, most people, I'll be honest, that I interacted with walking out of the show and even all the 27 years since or however long. And it really didn't think it was a great show, but I think it was a landmark show. I really do. And it was really like the last big, like mega tweezer fest, I think of that 94, 95 era where we saw a lot of them. Um, and I think it, it was just, you know, again, I'm going to go back to, I don't care what anybody says, Fish, you know, studied the blueprint of the Grateful Dead. They, people from Fish went to them and, and they've shared shared, you know, tips of the trade. And, you know, I think there's a lot to be said uh, for how, you know, Fish identified themselves, I think, that night. And, you know, how that show just stands out. There's really nothing like it. While musically, and for me, I only saw two shows that summer because I was seeing Grateful Dead shows. Um, I wanted to see more songs, right? But Fish made a statement and said, this is what we're going to do. And, you know, we will, before we get, I don't want to, you know, get ahead of myself, but um, I think you, you made a great choice just simply because it's, I think it's a milestone show in the band's history. Again, coming off of 94, I was super jaded on 94. They completely destroyed me five shows as a teenager in 94 and all the, and I was getting tapes. Talk about the tape thing. You know, I was getting tapes like, two weeks after the shows, which was insane back then. I had a connection with a connection that, you know, I was going to this guy's house on the regular for all fall 94. We're someday going to reveal on this podcast who that person is. It was the most amazing thing ever. Literally, I'd wait for that phone call. I, all right, you know, I've got Spartanburg. I'll be there. I'm coming. <laughs> and, and, you know, I bring tapes, uh, you know, and I'd have to go hustle tapes for him. He'd send me a list. Anyways, I digress. But, you know, 94 just completely ruined me. And it ruined my whole fish existence because I just think the band was bonkers that year. 926 shows. And that's, I mean, I could talk for days. So no yep. spring tour. First time, no spring tour forever. This 95 really blossoming, but like, all the, the new material, I think, changed them. You know, I really do. I think things changed. It was a totally different feel from 94 for me. So I was probably on the critical side of summer 95. Interesting. And Tom, that um, Lowell Mass, right? That was the 516 show where a bunch of the songs that you had written um, were debuted and and a lot of those songs were played at, at this show and, and lots of others. I know in the first set, which is like pretty standard, but the the it's ice is gets really strange and sort of previews what we're going to hear in the tweezer and then it dissolves into strange design which was uh 
I, I, I mean, it was a brand new song. Um, Tom, before we get into the, some more of the music, what was, what was going on with you at that time in terms of, in terms of the material you were, you were writing? Well, Lenny was even talking about how, and I was thinking the same thing, like, is a lack of new material, like what drove them into possibly in, in this period, was there like a little bit of a dip that possibly drove them into doing incredible jams with their existing material? And so like, as I listen to these shows in 95, um, I kind of try to remember what what were the new songs at the time? And of course, some were unveiled in, in Lowell. Um, but in 95, we were between the releases of uh, Hoist in 94 and Billy Breathes in 96. So this night, Strange Design, which technically is a Billy Breathe song, but it just wasn't ever put on the album, but it was recorded in that session. And Theme from the Bottom were played. And the two nights before at Blossom, they played Taste. So they were beginning to sprinkle in a lot of the Billy Breathe stuff. But for, for example, I looked up Waste, which is probably the more recognizable song uh, from, from Billy Breeze. And for that, they waited until uh, 1996 to play along with uh, Character Zero at the Joyous Lake at Woodstock, which was uh, an unannounced show in a bar uh, during the session of Billy Breeze. Uh, that was an amazing show, by the way. I hope we do it. Anyway, that's 1996. Let's go back. Uh, we got a lot of 95 still to talk about. That's fair. Um Lenny, what what were your impressions of the first set? Because I think it was like there there wasn't a lot happening here, but um, yeah. it did give you a taste for for what was this '95 flavor. Prototype first set for summer '95. Like you know, you could look at all of them. I don't care if you look at Bristow or Riverport, or you could look at Red both nights of Red Rocks, even past the show like Mansfield and, and Sugarbush. Uh, you know, pretty they were all pretty straightforward. Uh, mellow first sets it was a beautiful day. Couldn't believe, you know, it was the first fish mail order. So couldn't believe I had second row brought a good deadhead friend of mine for his first show. And uh, he's never been the same. And uh, you know, it was, you know, other than like probably maze brought that little taste to 94. Um, and I went into every show then like where's peaches and regalia, like where's Harpua. Wait, well, this isn't 94 anymore. It's 95. <laughs> it's theme from the bottom, right? There it's strange design. So, you know, sample opener, like Trey was super happy. And uh, I just remember, I just have vivid memories of a, a great, a great first set. I mean, it was pretty standard, pretty standard issue. But again, I think the theme in that summer, the new songs charted this new course and a lot of them were super mellow. The magic really didn't start happening until the second sets, but love the maze, um, divided sky and, uh, probably were the only real ones that were super moving. And, and, and it was probably me second row center saying, I'll just wait for the second set. Wait, do you see? And then, you know, and by the way, Tom, didn't like two days before Lowell, there was, didn't they play at Fish's house to warm those songs up? If I recall correctly, I think they did that. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't there for that. And I was kicking myself when I heard about what they played. Yes, yes. Yeah, okay. yeah. So like, yeah. And theme from the bottom on that, uh, we're getting to the second set, but you mentioned theme from the bottom and had me thinking about it as it opened the second set. But like, talk about a song that I felt had legs right out of the gate. Um, so we'll get to that. But like, you know, we'll pretty- get to that. Yeah, like Maze Divided and Sky were my takeaways of the energy out of that first set. Again, pretty uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah, yeah, and you're right that that a lot of those shows in Summer '95 were were pretty much the same. There's not a lot of, you know, it's it just amazing if you think about what we see now with Fish, where like any any point in any set can be the longest jam of the night, and it's just like this was just it was so predictable how how these first sets would go. I, I'm second row and I'm like, where's the big ball jam? Like, let's go. I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> like, come on. <laughs> They're like, we put the, we, we retired the balls. I'm already. like, dude, they, they bring balls out and we have to like hit them in, you know, in the band circle and like, it didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we got to get to this, to this fleezer. Um, but in, in classic taper format, we're going to flip the tape quickly by doing a break. Sure. And then we'll be back with the second side. Luckily, it's a 120-minute tape, so, so we yeah. have time. XLT. We'll be right back. Thanks. Exactly. Have you ever wondered what it would feel like if your investments reflected what matters most to you? At Green Future Wealth Management, the advisors specialize in helping clients manifest their values in their financial lives. Green Future Wealth Management was founded by certified financial planner practitioner and longtime fan Nick Cantrell, named by Forbes as one of the top next-gen wealth advisors in the country. Whether you are just getting started or have complex investing and financial planning needs, visit them on the web at greenfuturewealth.com. You can sign up for the email list 
or take the Investing Values quiz. When you feel ready, schedule a free virtual consultation. In appreciation for the amazing fish community and the incredible work being done by fans across the country, Green Future Wealth Management will be donating 10% of asset management proceeds from new Osiris listener clients to fans for racial equity. Just be sure to mention Osiris when booking your appointment. Create your green future. Securities offered through Cambridge Investment Research, Inc., member FINRA slash SIPC. Advisory services offered through Cambridge Investment Research Advisors, Inc. Cambridge and Green Future Wealth are not affiliated. And we're back. We are here with our guest, Lenny Stubbe. Um, Before we plunge into the second set and the ominous tweezer waiting for us there, um, I have to read you this review, which to me epitomizes this show. It's uh, it's from the fish net and it's from a guy named Jardale, whom you guys might know. I don't know if I know him or her. Um, he wrote, I took a buddy of mine to this show after hyping fish to him for over a year. It was his first show and it was brutal. The first set was average at best. And the second set was a huge WTF. I don't know what their deal was, but this was not a typical show for fish during this period. There were some cool moments, but overall I walked out seriously confused and compared to what I had seen them do the previous two years uh, and, and compared to what I'd seen them do the previous two years. My buddy didn't give up and eventually became a fan, but this show did not help. I was not a fan of this show, but I know some people that think this show is one of the greatest ever. So it just reinforces to each his own. So Lenny, a little bit, a taste of how polarizing this show (laughs) is. And uh, I believe RJ would even draw the distinction how polarizing summer 95 is. Yeah. Uh, you want me to take that, RJ? I mean, yeah, go for it. Yeah. There's, there's always going to be a squirrely person that, you know, out there <laughs> that just, you know, there wasn't really anybody that thought that was great. Like, let's be honest. It was <laughs> monumental from, you know, when you stand back and you, and you back it up and you look at it, it was monumental. But the actual, you know, what you digested and even Blossom, like, again, like, you know, I was coming off of what I, my expectations were high where, you know, you got, you got a fluff head, a tweezer, a Bowie, you know, a Mike's, Mike's groove that just smashed your face in every single night. And, you know, went into summer 95 expecting that, like, you know, and there are people that will talk about the David Bowie's of summer 95 and the tweezers of summer 95 and, and say, okay, yeah, it's a monumental tour because of all these great versions. And sure there is, but were those people on 94 that, that, you know, were, had their, face handed to him every single night with some insane, you know, jam. And the videos are, they're all over the place. Just go watch them. So in 95, for some of us, it was just like, okay, like I went to blossom fourth row in front of Mike. And it was just like, it was, it was a great show. I enjoyed it. They released it, they even released it. And I thought, okay, it's a great show. I, I didn't have any problems, but I didn't walk out of there saying it was the greatest thing I had seen. Um, you know, I just, just hadn't after what I had witnessed in Syracuse in 94. So, um, so, you know, I think you have to temper, uh, any, I think talk of greatness. Um, it was monumental. That's the word I'm going to use. Trey was in an unbelievable form. Evil bad Lieutenant Trey was completely on display in the second set. It was something to see. Um, you know, we could dive into the music, but literally I saw he was running around the stage with the mega, with the megaphone, like a madman, like literally doing complete laps around the stage. <laughs> in between. I think it was post my generation, if I'm, if I'm remembering it okay. correctly. But without getting too far ahead, I love the theme opener. Again, I think theme hit the ground running. Um, and it, it's just a great song, as we know, and it's a great type one song. Um, and But for me, the highlight is really that jam that as t- theme stopped, started uh ahead of the tweezer there's like five minutes of you know of bliss on the tape and uh it's really you know i think a little melodic and it just got a great feel to it it's a really cool jam and before we go forward i have to ask because i want to know did did you what happened i mean not your entire fish history but was was 94 the peak for you overall or did you hit peaks later yeah, I hit peaks later. So like I, my first show was Dairy in 93 and I probably started listening in the spring or summer of 93. Dead Dead Friends got me going. So I didn't miss Dairy. And, and then I was full board in 94, even though I was a broke teenager and I couldn't get to a whole lot of shows. I, I got to California to end the tour in Santa Monica. But um, nice. 
Yeah, that was super special. In four nights at the, of the Grateful Dead at LA Sports Arena helped. So, uh, but, you know, I think, um, no, ni- December 95, you know, I saw a whole bunch, you know, a good handful and, um, you know, Binghamton, Niagara Falls, Cleveland, Albany. Um, so I think that was a huge peak come that winter. And that's a whole, obviously a whole nother podcast. But, um, and then, you know, 96, I was a little underwhelmed. And I felt like the change was coming again, like the evolution. We hit another stage. Uh, there's been many stages. And, uh, you know, and sure enough, I did. I made the cardinal sin and I, I moved to Florida in 97 to start a career. <laughs> and I skipped 97. So <laughs> I got back at Polaris and got the Isabella at Polaris in 98. Nice, so, 98. Yeah, yeah. So I missed the peak. I watched it from IRC with Craig Hillwig and everybody and Mike O'Day and all those great people and Allie. Um and uh, I watched 94 from IRC chat. So, and wow. Yeah, okay, so to answer so, your question, yeah, those were peaks. So it was like, so the, so the summer 95 really was just like a, it was just a period that didn't hit you as hard as others. I was just, I was making sure that 94 wow. wasn't the peak that you stopped at and you never listened to, never no. liked anything again. Yeah. I mean, it was number 95 is Jerry passing away for everybody. Right. And like, yeah. but you are people and on Twitter and wherever else they chat nowadays uh, that will tell you all the great things about summer 95. Like I said, but I, I you know, and there are great, mo- amazing moments throughout yeah. the whole tour, but yeah. you know, I'm not, it just wasn't for me and because of what I was experiencing. I mean, I was at the Clifford ball still waiting for peaches and regalia. So, you know, <laughs> I just was so, I got ruined by that year. It destroyed me. It destroyed me. It was an unbelievable year. It's got the most official releases. So that's, I'll leave it at yeah. that. Yeah. I think that's, and we just, and now we're like, I mean, we've done, I guess we did, do we do five 94 shows? I think we did for this season. So, so yeah. you know, um, four or five. So, okay. So we got to talk about this tweezer. So yeah. the, the three tweezers before this on summer tour, Salt Lake, Nissan, Mud Island, all were like crazy, weird adventures. Um, it's interesting that you, like you mentioned that jam going into it, they, the tempo in the tweezer is, is really pretty slow, you know? And, and it, the, the whole thing kind of like, it's pretty slow until like 12 minutes in, there's like, it kind of just like shifts to this like blues jam. And then like, suddenly yeah. we're in like a different chapter. Yeah. Like even think about that. Was that a prelude to Halloween? Like in certain things we might've heard on Halloween that year. Right. Right. Um, so there were things, that's why I say monumental. There were things happening this night that yeah. are really, really worth talking about. Um, but musically speaking, you know, we sat there, the tw- when I think of the Fleezer and I thought about it when I walked out, I remember walking out, having this conversation, it was pure insanity. It was a little dip in the 94 that that's where I got my 94 from the in, pure insanity and evilness of the jam and how dark it got right in that tweezer. It <laughs> yeah. was, it was insanity for a while. It was for a big chunk of it. Trey was completely possessed and we could speculate. And I love fun fish conspiracies musically uh, <laughs> that, you know, talk about why they did something this night, you know? Um, and I'll still say that, but like, yeah, it just got really dark. It was very chaotic. And um, you know, it's listenable. I mean, obviously it's listenable, but you know, people, uh, people don't love it. People don't go back to it. I don't know anybody that goes back to it and says, I got to hear the Fleezer tonight. Uh, were, there, just, were there theories, Lenny, that can be mentioned on a family show like ours uh, as to yeah. why this uh, why my, this night? My biggest theory, I, I kind of sat a little, pre, a little ahead of it, but like, I think, you know, in my opinion, Tom, you know way better than me, but, uh, you know, I know Trey thinks thinks about Jerry and thinks about the dead and, and that, and he, he did a great job for a long time, forever, keeping the two things separate, right? We are, we are our band. We are our own identity. And you and think the proximity of the bands it, it, that night in the same. I think it was a statement. Yeah. It's just, it was my, a statement. I, I have fun thinking about that. I think it was a statement, you know, you people have said that I've seen that. I've seen that for sure. You got your summer solstice, Scarlet fire. Here's and that's shirt. something I would never ask Trey. Yeah, don't ask him. No. I would never ask him like because I don't really want to know. Because <laughs> I don't want to ask. Him. I don't like. I got. I was after show one time and that was it. I, I never did it again. It was a good experience, but you know, I, you know, Amy and Brad stared me down for a little bit. But other than that, uh, I never went back because I want to keep it separate. You know, I want to keep. I want. I want to be on the one side of the stage. That's all. And that's just as a fan, Tom. Like that's just me. Right. It's been. It's been weird for thirty-eight years being on the dividing line. Right. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. But yeah, I think like you got your summer souls to Scarlet Fire, meaning me. And then Trey uh, made a statement in Canandaigua that night. And it was just so different. Like I was at the 94 Canandaigua show the year before. Uh, again, a very different show before the insanity of Big Birch 
Uh, I'm sorry, right. the day after the insanity of Big Birch. Right. It was like a big decompression from Big Birch, right? And uh, I don't know. I just think this stuff happens for a reason. And maybe we can go further into it. But like, you know, when you think about the band, I don't know. It's been talked about. I know. I think it's in one of the, maybe one of the Farmer's Almanacs. But the band, you know, they, they did the My Generation thing. It was really vocal. I never considered it My Generation. They were over some different, they were on yeah. some sort of a melody. Like, we're yeah. just going, going on when I re-listened yeah. to it. And then boom, they're just, you know, they're just out of nowhere, just, you know, talking prelude to Halloween. And then they, as it ends, as it winds down, it gets to this, the chaos is over. Evil Trey is in this different zone. He's done running circles around the stage. Like he was literally behind the black curtain with the <laughs> megaphone, just running, sprinting. So all that chaos kind of calmed down and it just kind of mellowed out. And then they actually like hid. I don't know if you guys know this or I don't know if there's video of it, but um, they all left Trey or they all left Paige to the spotlight. Like Mike <laughs> went and hid under something Trey or somebody hit under the piano, fish crouched <laughs> down, but they were all still playing. They were all still playing in this jam. You could hear it. And, but the, the focus is on Paige. And I, that's why I think the birth of keyboard Calvary came, uh, which eventually be, became keyboard army. Amazing. Ah. That is really cool. I have not seen videos. That, but that I don't sounds, think there's video of it. I think so I don't think there's video of it. But that's what happened. They were all, they all we wanted to focus on Paige, right? Like, yeah. so they all hid. <laughs> you could see them. Like, they were there. Like, like fish is behind the kid. Like, that's what lights are for, you know? They, yeah. You could let the lights do that. I mean, Listen I think, like, there, there are parts of this where it feels like you're on, like, a an elevator stopping at different worlds, you know, like <laughs> to, they're like between these different interludes, it's like you're in, you're in totally different sonic space. Some of them, they're like, they're all playing really fast, but like totally dissonant, like none of it makes sense. And then there's like something slow that around like 28 minutes, I was like, is this like music? Yeah. I don't know if you can consider this music. Cause it's just yeah. like, it's just noises. Um, and then Fishman, does a little vacuum interlude, right? Yes, that's at right. one point. Yeah, he does. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I do think up right from the kit. Yeah, he was up that there. the post page piano solo, like the the very end. There's like five minutes that are really beautiful, and that's like I think that's the best part. And it's like you know, it's like minute you know thirty eight to forty two or something. Um, right before that part, though, I just I just have to, you have to yeah, know my yeah. That I labeled I labeled it's like thirty minutes to that that like ending bliss, I, I call it sonic death to all listeners. That's my, uh, that's my label for it. And it's just, I don't know what it is. Is it music? <laughs> it's a music, you know, I mean, you know, they're playing instruments and they're on stage, but um, I, you know, the, the, that like cool ending jam and then like the triumphant return into Tweezer reprise is it's amazing. I mean, that's I a pretty it. cool way to end. Um, it is. Yeah. It ended great. Yeah. Yeah. Where people, what was like, what was the reaction when they went into Tweezer reprise? I mean, were people like, what? <laughs> yeah, it what's was going quick. On? like, it was hundred. I do have memory of it being like quick, like, mm -hmm. whoa, like we, we're done. Like that was it. Like it was, it felt like a lot, but then it, it was over. And uh, yeah. So like it felt fast and I don't know what the timing is on it. A little over an hour probably, but um, it just felt like it was over and that was it. And, and imagine, like, I haven't made this personal at all and, and not about me one bit, but imagine telling your good buddy who's a deadhead, trying to explain to him what the hell's going on. It was, <laughs> I there must've been lots of people in that situation. Cause yeah. Yeah. The second it, it show was been. the 95 okay. slave at, at uh, uh. Niagara Falls. So that, fixed it like that. He's like, Whoa, wow. Whoa. His second show. Like, he's like, I got it. But yeah, Tom, like there were, you know, sure. There were people over in Albany, but like there were absolutely a ton of new, new fans there. It was definitely hundred percent more full in 95 than it was 94. There was a hundred percent growth for sure. Wow. When I, read, when I read that fish uh, net review, I was thinking like, had I brought like, you know, my wife or a family member there as their first show, just, I would be kind of apologizing It'd be a, there'd be a wonderful dinner, you know, yeah. <laughs> to, yeah. or a bottle of wine or I'm something so to sorry. make up for. Yeah. I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> he was like, what the hell was that? Yeah. I'm like, you know, you know how I got him to go is second row. I'm like, dude, we're going to be second row. You got to come with me. I'm telling you, believe me, this is it. It's you like the dead, but different. It's so different, but it's so much the same. <laughs> same feeling. You're going to get the same feeling. And you got it. At the Niagara Falls, they did the traffic light. He got it. So I, okay. I, made, right. I made good on it five, six months later. <laughs> what 
so I, we got to go back to this. I think you guys have both sort of posited some theories, but there is this summer 95 is so strange. Um, and it's so different from the fall of 95 where like the sound is, I mean, if you take like the, you know, that Orlando show, you know, with like this or the Binghamton show, which have these like pieces of, of improv that are, but they're like, they're short and they're compact and they're beautiful and kind of melodic, but also a little dark. But this is sort of like free jazz improv all summer. I'm just wondering, like you mentioned the the new material, lack of new material, Lenny, but why do you guys think summer 95 was so strange? Like, is there a prevailing theory or is there a, is there a way for us to understand that? Because I do think once you get into fall 95, it's just a, it's a different world sonically. Uh, if uh, I'll take the two, you know, the two theories, I'll summarize the two theories. One was uh, the sort of a dearth of new material and the other was proximity of the dead breathing down their neck, I guess. Uh, uh, you know, and, and Lenny take it from there, elaborate. Yeah. I mean, I think when I think of, when I think of summer 95 and specifically the tweezer, I always think with fish, there's an inside joke, right? So, you know, there's some, you know, there's something, of course we don't know. And, me in you know we just we are it's fun we speculate about it and, and it's a lot of fun but yeah i think you know again there was no spring tour right remember that right mm. when was the last time there was no spring tour right uh when you think about it um yeah i don't i don't know like 80s somewhere in the 80s but i mean never maybe that was the yeah. first non-spring tour i'm sorry i don't have i don't have the reference no, but it was it was that was a staple of their of their touring from yeah. From the late 80s yeah spring, spring right so yeah so yeah i mean there's great springs in 91 92 93 94 no spring in 95 and new material amazing new material and uh you know a band that was colliding on the road literally peaking in large venues with them right and you know i don't know what the inside joke is that night in canandaigua or on the whole tour um and i agree like you have to remember like fall tour started in cal expo at 927 and post jerry dying right so now there's a whole nother layer element and i don't want to overplay it i don't think it like dominated anything i don't think no. they like did anything about it i just no. think stuff happened right like yes. you know whether consciously or unconsciously exactly unconsciously mm -hmm. so much you know goes into yeah. even like a set list like yeah. yeah but also just his whole life or or the whole band's life but yeah. if they start tweeting and saying what is he talking about they had nothing to do he's out of his mind like i totally disagree with you <laughs> like i'll i'll debate that to the finish um, i do you think and there there's a theory that it was like trying to repel deadheads from the scene, right? Is, is sure. that like how? How? I mean, that to me is is distinctly different from like trying to be their own band, and maybe there's some overlap there. But like basically taking big chances and just doing what they wanted, which they always do. You know, like they have a big stage, and they the the drummer who wears a dress like plays the vacuum. You know, and you're like, why would you do that at this like important show at MSG or whatever? But I don't know. Those things are different. I don't think they were like doing it maliciously, but I know that was a, that was a theory. Cause why wouldn't you want more fans for your band? Yeah. There's a ton of conscious and there's like Tom said, there's a ton of unconscious, you know, things that happen that, you know, are just either going to be for a particular reason or that, Hey, you know what? Uh, this is just, this is just who we are and this is going to roll this way. But I think fish, that's the definition of this band, the evolution and the, we do things on our terms the way we want to do it. And I just personally think Trey, always and i i i was really felt like i had my finger on the pulse for of it in the 90s like always just wanted to completely differentiate himself from anything you know that related from that band you know completely so i take that basis and then i start to form my own speculation and opinions on it or thoughts or breakdowns or analysis you know so um but yeah it's, a, it's the best that, anyone of us can do it's a it, yeah, yeah but i think you probably came as close as anyone can i like it I think that's a fair, I mean, I guess my last question is what do you, both of you guys now looking back now that we've kind of re-listened and revisited it, what do you think the significance of this, of this show is? I mean, you, you, you've said it a couple of times, Lenny, as, as sort of monumental, but where, where do you think this show falls in the, in the, in the story? Yeah. I mean, the last of the big tweezer fest of, of that particular mid nineties pre Jerry era hundred percent um and okay did we get on something there all the tweezer fests led you know leading up to 
you know, a huge change, right? A death. Uh, I don't know whether there are any tweezer fests. There was great tweezers, New Haven and 95 and fall and uh, different ones. But was there any of that like Bangor 94, you know, Bozeman, yeah. you know, Mud Island, right? You just kind of go right down the list, a bunch of 94. Um, yeah. You know, those were real statements, right? So, um, yeah, I, I am, in my opinion, I was on the 90. I came from Blossom. I went to Albany, saw the Grateful Dead, came back to the Fleezer, saw what they did and knew exactly what they did. So I think it was a statement. Tom, do you have anything to add? No, I think Lenny summarized it better than I could. Um, and that's, uh, unless there's anything else, that's probably a good place for us yeah. to end. I mean, it's, 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 it was amazing to go back to this just to re- remind myself how strange, how strange this all can be, you know? We, I, there was like, an inside, we don't know what the inside joke was, but there no, was. I, I think there was some inside something and, yeah. uh, you know, where they, doing it for each other or for themselves, or was this just some madness that simultaneously came out of them for whatever reason, it was incredible. And, you know, I, I thank the powers that be at Osiris for having me re-listen to this. I think I'd heard it <laughs> once in my life because someone made me listen to it, but I, had I been at that show, I don't think I would have enjoyed it. Honestly, it's, it, it, it's too strange. It's too, uh, it's, there's, you know, there's evil, but with not enough payoff. Yeah. 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 Yeah, and amazing. I wanted songs. I was only seeing two shows. I'm like, give me some songs. I'm right. Some. There's new songs. Like, yeah, yeah. Exactly. I'm always a songs guy. Ask our I took off for a week on the road <laughs> to always. see the dead. And I just wanted to fish songs. So yep, like yep. Yeah. well, thank well, you yeah. so much. Thank you, yeah. Lenny. And thank you, RJ, um, yeah. my co-host, my wonderful co-host, and our fellow executive producers. We always have to thank Benji Eisen and Matt Dwyer. And we'll be back in a couple of days and we'll we'll continue our examination of the stellar shows in 19. 1995. Uh, please remember to review and subscribe wherever you listen or watch. And we're going to see you in a few days. And until then, blaze on. Thank you. Osiris. Oh,